Number 1. Fowler lost her apartment, vehicle and many belongings when a tornado struck her hometown of Joplin, Missouri in May 2011. After the disaster, she moved into a FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, trailer. Her family last heard from her on July 7, 2012. That morning her mother went to the trailer to pick her up, but no one was home. They never heard from Fowler again. Authorities believe Fowler is with her boyfriend, Dennis Dwayne Gideon Jr. Photos of Gideon are posted with this case summary. He's described as Caucasian, 5'8 tall. His date of birth is January 6, 1980, making him 32 years old in 2012, the same age as Fowler. He has not been reported missing, but his family hasn't heard from him either. Fowler left behind three children. Her father died in 2017, but her mother and other relatives are still searching for her. Fowler and Gideon reportedly moved to Stevens County, Washington in June 2013. Their last known address, as in an apartment in Spokane, Washington, and they may still be in that city or in the Spokane Valley area of Washington. The circumstances of their cases are unclear. Number 2. She was everyone's little angel Martha Gill Hamilton said of little sister, Elizabeth Ann Gill. Elizabeth, known to family as Beth, was sweet-natured and trusting, according to Martha, who said that Beth was always doted on by strangers who called her precious. Beth was the youngest of ten siblings and had been pampered and spoiled, but, Martha noted, she was never one to throw a fit. As with most two-year-olds, Beth trusted everyone, said Martha, who is 13 years older than Beth. She told us that people would approach her little sister and she would readily follow them. Their father had grown up in the same neighborhood in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, and the Gill family trusted the people there. We always considered it a safe neighborhood. Everyone knew everyone, Martha said. On Sunday, June 13, 1965, 15-year-old Martha was traveling from Chicago back home to Missouri with her mother and one of her other sisters. Martha's father was also out of town for work, Martha said. The remaining eight Gill children, including Beth, were at the family's Cape Girardeau home. Martha would later learn that around 4 o'clock that afternoon, her siblings and other neighborhood children noticed that Beth was nowhere to be seen. The children would later say they had searched all outside and inside the house, yelling for Beth. But they couldn't find her anywhere. According to Martha, one of the children called the police. We were driving into town and we saw all the police officers and thought, wow, something is going on, Martha told us. We pulled into our driveway and saw a crowd around our house. When they said Bethy was missing, my mom passed out. When Martha and her mother arrived, it had only been 30 minutes since the children had realized Beth was missing. So I thought, 30 minutes? We're going to find her. We're going to find her, Martha said. Since she was the oldest sibling there, Martha said she took care of the younger kids and kept them out of the way so the police could work. The family was devastated. You can't imagine. Everyone was torn up, Martha said. But we were blessed to have a large family in that we counseled each other. According to Martha, the next morning, the police received a tip from a local auto dealer. A man called and said there had been a couple staying in the motel behind the Gill residence. The couple had been waiting for a part for their car to come in, according to the dealer. The dealer had told them the part wouldn't come in until Monday the 14th. According to Martha, the couple had told the auto dealer that was okay with them as they would be staying in town for another week. But when the car part arrived on Monday and the dealer called the motel to tell the couple, he learned the couple had checked out early and were gone. Martha said the dealer reported to police that the couple had checked out the day before, around the time Beth went missing. Martha told us police investigated the lead and discovered the couple had been using fake names and changing their license plates. They had been in Cape Girardeau for a while, selling purses by knocking on people's front doors. Martha told us she and some of her family members did recall seeing a woman selling purses around the neighborhood before Beth's disappearance. Martha continued to say she remembers a woman had twice tried to call Beth over to her car. One time, someone at the motel saw a woman talking to Bethy. The other time, my mom and brother saw the woman talking to Bethy in our front yard near her car. My mom called her back 
and told her to come inside, Martha told us. Though Martha said police tried multiple tactics, authorities were unable to track down the couple. According to Martha, police traced the car back to the original dealer, where the car was purchased, a dealership in Lake Orion, Michigan. Martha said police also traced the purses back to the factory where they were manufactured, but there was no information on the people who bought them. On Christmas Day, 1966, Martha's father Harry Gill wrote a letter to President Lyndon Johnson asking that the FBI be brought into the investigation to track down two transient couples from the motel, writing, if these persons could be found, I feel certain our little girl will be found, or at least we can learn what happened to her. He closed the letter noting, my three brothers and I all volunteered to serve our country in World War II. I served from January 1941 to December 1945. Now I am asking, through you, that my country serve my family's sick need. A couple of weeks later, in January of 1967, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover replied to the letter, which had been forwarded to the FBI from the White House. Hoover wrote that, while the FBI had added Elizabeth as a missing person in their files in April of 1966, I must advise you that the FBI is precluded from conducting active investigation concerning missing persons in the absence of evidence indicating a violation within our investigative jurisdiction. Hoover added that the FBI would keep in touch with the Cape Girardeau police should any evidence indicating an abduction in violation of the federal kidnapping statute come to light. Decades passed. Beth's sister Martha told us that people still periodically called police with tips. According to Martha, several more people called in to say they had seen the woman from the motel talking to Beth, trying to coax the two-year-old to her car. Others reported a car driving erratically in the area at the time of Beth's disappearance, Martha told us. Another person, according to Martha, said that she saw people meeting the motel couple's description buying clothes for a child crying for her mother. Retired Cape Girardeau Police Department Detective Jimmy Smith told us he was assigned Beth's case in 2003. Detective Smith told us he first became aware of the case because someone called with a tip, but when he went to look for her files, he couldn't find any. I couldn't locate any case files at the police department. We had very little paperwork, debt. Smith said. Then I found out that Elizabeth had living relatives in the area, so I contacted them. Detective Smith told us he worked with what he had. He spoke with the family and read the papers from the 1960s to try to piece the case together. One of the first things we did was collect DNA samples from the family with help from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and entered it into the database, he said. There were no cameras or physical evidence collected at the scene, he added, and there were few leads off of which to work but about seven years after debt. Smith began working on the case, Beth's family got renewed hope when the FBI finally joined the team. Back around 2010, the FBI finally got involved and reclassified the case as a kidnapping, debt. Smith told us. It's been all these years, and I can't say for certain that she's still living, but there is nothing telling me she's dead. Martha told us that for years, it was too painful for her parents to talk about Beth's disappearance, and both had now passed away without ever learning what happened to their daughter. Martha told us that before their mother died, she had expressed hope that 21st century technology could help find her daughter. Martha told us that she and her siblings have submitted their DNA to the Ancestry and 23andMe sites. Even though we have not found answers about Beth, we had two women who contacted us thinking they could be Beth. They didn't end up being Beth, but those women found their families and answers, she said. If enough attention is brought to the case, maybe someone will question their origins. It's more likely Beth would find us than us finding Beth. You never know where that one coincidence would come in. Martha said all of Beth's siblings have a sorrow and a place in our heart that will always feel empty. I'm still hopeful. Of course, she added, I'm not looking for jail or true justice, I'm just looking for answers and my sister. According to Detective Smith, the case is currently at a standstill as there is no new information to go on in the investigation. I've been retired three years and I was the only one actively working on the case, debt. Smith told us. As for the couple the original investigation focused on, debt. 
Smith said he is convinced they're responsible. It was the best lead back then, and it continues to be the best lead to this day. In a portion of the original police report, which Beth's father included in his letter to President Johnson, two couples seen at the motel behind the Gill House are noted. A white male aged 60 to 65, described as a natty dresser. His companion was a white female with white hair, over 60 years old, 5'1", 150 pounds. The second couple was a white female, believed to be the daughter of the other woman, 5'2", with red hair, and her husband, also white, 6'1", with a slender build. While all those noted would probably no longer be living, the FBI has interviewed people who might be acquaintances or relatives of those in the report. In the years since Beth disappeared, her sister Martha has devoted time to volunteering with Team Hope at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children to offer support for other families of the missing. I have very strong faith and I almost feel like this has been a calling for me. Part of healing is helping others, Martha told us. Elizabeth Ann Gill would be 56 years old today. At the time of her disappearance, Elizabeth was 2'6 and weighed about 22 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes. If you have any information on the circumstances surrounding Elizabeth's disappearance or where she might be today, please call the Cape Girardeau Police Department at 573-335-6621. Number 3. Jack is missing with his wife, Patricia. They were last seen in Clayton, Missouri on June 11, 1975. Their 17-year-old daughter, Joanne, stated her parents left that morning to attend a funeral. Jack allegedly took a .38 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver with him. Jack and Patricia entered an unidentified large green limousine or Cadillac and never returned. Before he left, Jack promised to call Joanne to give her a telephone number where they could be reached in case of emergency. Neither of them have ever been heard from again. The Jairus's son reported the missing on June 17. He went to their residence to celebrate for Father's Day with them, and no one was home. He'd been unable to reach them by telephone for the past several days. He found his parents' dog was in the backyard without food and water, and all of Jack and Patricia's belongings, including their vehicles, toothbrushes and two uncashed paychecks, were left behind. The garage and the windows were unlocked. Joanne stated she had an argument with her father the night before his disappearance. He disapproved of her boyfriend's and her drug use and wanted her to move out the next day. She did pack her belongings on June 12 and went to stay with her sister. She would later move in with her brother in Minnesota. All of the Jairus's relatives took polygraph tests. Joanne's was inconclusive, possibly due to her emotional state. She may have been under the influence of drugs on June 11, so her memory of that morning may not have been accurate. Authorities discovered a car matching Joanne's description of the one her parents got into was on the street that morning, but it was there to pick up a neighbor. Patricia has a degree from Webster College and taught mathematics in the Rockwood School District at the time of her disappearance. Jack worked as a tool and eye maker. Both were considered reliable and it's uncharacteristic of them to miss work without calling in. Prior to their disappearances, they'd purchased 10 acres of land and planned to build their retirement home on the plot. The Jairus have four children, and only Joanne was living with them by the time they disappeared. Foul play is suspected in Patricia and Jack's cases, which remain unsolved. Number 4 Teresa was last seen with Alfred Hoffman Marshall on October 9, 1976. They were students at Waynesville High School, and both were the children of officers at the Fort Leonard Wood Army Base. They left on a date in Alfred's car at 7.30 p.m. They never returned and have never been heard from again. The following day, their car was found locked and abandoned on a side road in an isolated area of Fort Leonard Wood. In spite of the freezing weather, Alfred's jacket was found in the backseat of the vehicle. His hairbrush, which he never went anywhere without, was in the console. There was no evidence of foul play. Although investigators initially thought the pair had run away, Alfred and Teresa's loved ones didn't believe this. Teresa was a good student and a member of the school's band. The band had won a district contest qualifying it to compete in a state competition, and Teresa was excited about it. 
In January 1977, three teenagers were murdered at Fort Leonard Wood while out on a double date. Johnny Lee Thornton, a military police officer, pulled them over as they crossed into the fort, shot the boys to death, sexually assaulted the girls, shot them also, and dumped the four bodies. One girl from the group survived by playing dead. She walked for six miles to the nearest house to call for help. Thornton pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, claiming he had multiple personalities, but was convicted and sentenced to three life terms plus 20 years in prison. He is considered a suspect in the disappearances of Alfred and Teresa Well. Alfred's car was found abandoned not far from where the murder victims' bodies were dumped. In spite of the circumstances, however, no evidence has been found to tie Thornton to Alfred and Teresa's disappearances. He remains in federal prison and the cases are still unsolved. Number 5 Grunst was last believed to be hitchhiking from Joplin, Missouri to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She was last seen in the vicinity of Interstate 44 and Highway 43 in Joplin when she got into a truck driven by a man from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Grunst was living in Milwaukee at the time and looking for work there. She made a call from a Pittsburgh, Kansas payphone at 11.40 a.m. on October 9, 1984, the day after she left Joplin. She has never been heard from again. From what her mother understood, Clara planned to hitchhike from Joplin to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where she was living at the time and looking for a job. She was last witnessed at a truck stop, entering a truck near Highway 44 and Highway 43 in Joplin. The driver of the truck, who was from Milwaukee, was located and questioned. He reportedly gave conflicting statements, but there wasn't sufficient evidence to charge him with any wrongdoing. Clara is believed to have made a phone call to her brother at 11.40 a.m. the following day from a payphone in Pittsburgh, Kansas, and nobody has heard from her since. Clara enjoyed traveling and hitchhiked often. She communicated via CB radio, using the handles Missouri Sunshine, Blondie, and Blue Eyes. It appears that Clara had been reported missing previously. In September 1981, when she was 18, she had last been seen at a Greyhound bus station in Springfield, Missouri. The mother of one of her friends received a phone call from her, in which she said she would be arriving in Carthage, Missouri that night. When the bus arrived, Clara was not on it. Her mother had understood that she was going to Republic, Missouri to babysit. It's not 100% clear whether she returned following this 1981 disappearance, only to vanish again in 1984, or if there was only one disappearance and the year has been reported incorrectly. I lean toward the idea that she vanished twice because there are differences in the circumstances as well as the year. However, this find a grave entry lists her date of death as 1981. It reads like an obituary and contains information that only someone who knew Clara could provide. The entry includes information on her schooling and lists several family members as surviving her. In 2011, Clara's mother held a memorial service. She passed away in May 2019. Her four siblings continue to seek answers. Number 6 Haslag was last seen at approximately 12 p.m. on June 17, 2007, at a residence in the 13,000 block of Mini Street in Russellville, Missouri. She was scheduled to pick up her children at 12.30 p.m. the following day from their father's residence in Bland, Missouri, but never arrived. Her green 1996 Toyota was found abandoned on June 20 in a field off Highway 94 in Mockane, Missouri, across the Missouri River. This was in the opposite direction from the route Haslag would have taken to pick up her children. The license plate and battery had been removed from the vehicle, which had nothing in it. Haslag's mother filed a missing persons report on June 21, four days after she was last seen. Haslag's boyfriend was the last person to see her. He originally stated he last saw her when she left Russellville to get her children, then changed his story and stated she dropped him off at a Walmart store. The boyfriend was incarcerated on drug charges after Haslag disappeared. Haslag was herself involved with drugs prior to her disappearance and was due to appear in court on July 18, 2007, on charges of possessing materials to make methamphetamine and intent to distribute marijuana, both felonies. She missed her court date. 
she did not have a criminal record prior to these charges. Authorities believe foul play was involved in Haslag's disappearance. They think her case may be drug-related. Her disappearance remains unsolved.